uh, someone who's just, just learned how to do this stuff. This is, you know, you've also invested in training and all the other good stuff. Uh, but if it takes that much sort of power to go through these problems, then why would anyone ever patch or worry about them, right? And this is what you see. When we look at engagements, no one really, if it's not easily exploitable, and it has to be, you know, red, orange, or, uh, you know, whatever the colors, I'm not good at colors, whatever those other colors are we use uh, in the little uh, flag that we have. If it's not sort of completely obviously exploitable, no one's going to patch it. If you have Windows 2003 SP2 and heap cookies and all this other good stuff, it's never, ever going to be easily exploitable, ever. So no one's ever going to patch it because no one cares. And if they do patch it, it's because their patching policy is set. You know, it's on six months or whatever. But it's never going to affect them because they probably never get broken into. But they will by us. How about the native code um, data set should be generated by just in time compiling? All right. So in the case, even if in the case when you have like, for example, in bugs we found in Java, yeah. uh, Java stuff where there is a buffer overflow and a native Java extension. Sure. Yeah. And, and you will find some rare things that are outliers. But in reality, if you go to exploit them, I bet you'll realize that DEP and safe SEH and all the other stuff is still going to really annoy you. Right? Or in Linux's case, you're running GRSec and it may not matter anyway. Right? Or the uh, reordering that they've done with the new compilers. It's still going to be really tough. And, and here's the, the thing that we enjoy about this is that if we go into a big organization, not like a mom and pop retail shop, but if you're going into something really big, and I have an exploit that works 1% of the time in a sort of flat random distribution, well, I still win because they're guaranteed to have 20 of them, and I have a 1 in 5 chance, and I try it today, and they reboot a few of them, and I try it again tomorrow, and I eventually will get in, and it'll take like a week maybe, but at some point, a, the galaxy is big enough that you're going to find life somewhere, <laughs> right? So, and that's, this is what, if you are a professional who, who can get to that level, this is the advantage you start to have. I have 10 minutes, so we're going to whip through this stuff. But um, so, and this is where you start to see the problem with, with sort of uh, ignoring memory corruption. It depends on your style. Normally, these would, would come in in a little filtery thing, but uh, awesomeness of open office graphics, great. So here's, here's what we see a lot when we do. We do a bunch of assessments here on the street. I guess we're not on the Wall Street, are we? But down on the street. Uh, you see, they, they, they'll have a nice, solid IS, and their whole app has you know, been scanned a thousand times. No SQL injection or anything obvious. There's, there's no cross-site scripting either. Uh, but they also have, they'll have a Citrix farm. They'll have an OFX server. They'll have a FIX server. In the back, they'll have an AIX 5.1. And then they'll have like an FTP server that they're using to move the really big files from back and forth from the trading stuff, logs and whatnot. And so what we see is, there's going to be an ISAPI, maybe, on the web server uh, that does have a vulnerability. And we may be able to exploit that even without ever getting the ISAPI, which you can do with a bunch of different techniques, because the ISAPIs will sort of reload after you crash them. Uh, and sometimes what we'll do is we'll actually download your ISAPI for you. We'll eval it, and we'll find the vulnerability in that, and we'll uh, exploit the vulnerability that way. And after you get a shell that way, people get very upset. And they say, oh, we were about to take that off, but then they never do. Uh, and of course, the FTP servers and the OFX stuff, no one's looked at OFX libraries. I don't know why. They're all written in C, and they're installed on crappy Solaris servers, right? And we're all, there's a lot of financial people here, right? OFX is what you use to do the, uh, like when you do QuickBooks to your bank, that's OFX, right? So this is what we hear after we break into somebody who's essentially been protected from buffer overflows for the last five years as far as they're concerned is you hear something like, only someone like Immunity could have done that, to which I say the Mafia is probably better than Immunity. Uh, and for sure, the nation states are better than Immunity. Uh, or, you know, at stake, or your, your consulting group of choice. No. They have more money. They ha yeah, they have more money. Well, I hope they do. Um, and of course, they also say, oh, it's just too late to change our technology decisions. You know, we, we've invested in this stuff. We've, we've had an IDS forever. We're going to have that forever, right? We're like, well, we just broke in with your IDS. And they're like, well, we're, we're still going to keep it. Um, and they say, or they'll say, yeah, that's something for someone else to fix. And I picked on Microsoft and IBM here. 
But essentially, they'll, they'll make it someone else's problem. Like, well, the platform, like, Windows didn't protect me from a buffer overflow and someone else's random code? What's wrong with them? <laughs> so you get that a lot. And the other big thing you'll get is, oh, but you would need source to write that up. And there's two things there. Is one, I usually have source. And two, uh, I don't always need source to write up this stuff and find it and stuff like that. So, uh, and by me, I usually mean cost share, someone better than me. Uh, so the, the graph is sort of a semi-representative. I didn't you know, put numbers into a spreadsheet. Uh, so here's what you see. Uh, buffer overflows start affecting things in ways that people uh, will, will not expect. Because nowadays, you have private clouds everywhere. You have your own personal private virtualization setup. Uh, and you maybe are using Google App Engine or uh, Amazon's app setup or any number of public clouds that are out there. Uh, but the thing about a cloud is I don't just own that one machine. I own everything on the cloud. I own every application. I own all the data. I own everybody else that's sharing that cloud with me. I also own. Uh, and so it becomes a bit more exciting for me to write the overflow, even though as far as you're concerned, overflows are basically impossible uh, or memory corruption bugs in general. And a good example of this was the Google App Engine integer overflow that came out pretty much the day they launched Google App Engine, right? All of a sudden, they're issuing a security advisory for their entire cloud. And imagine if you were a customer with data on that cloud, how awesome you would feel about that, right? Sorry, what was the first bit? Uh, what's the target? The target of this? Python yeah, it was, a, it was actually in one of the Python uh, C modules that they were using to do image stuff, I believe. Or no, it was the unzipping. It was un uncompression. And so there was an integer overflow that would get you code execution on that box, which is the whole point of their thing to prevent that. The yeah, yeah. I mean, they were running on 64-bit Linux, which had lots of protections. Yeah. But, uh, and of course, it was impossible to exploit. <laughs> so at least, at least there was that, right? So, and this is what happens, right? It's like, you're like, well, it was, there was never an exploit. It was just a proof of concept, no need to worry. Right? The software industry would love to hear the no need to worry. Right? But in reality, uh, yeah, if, if you destroy all of buffer overflows, in fact, they just come back to haunt you as a little spectral ghost giving you bad advice. <laughs> uh, so here's, where, where I, here's what I think. And it's not just me. And, and you know, I'm happy to point you to other people who think like this as well, like Halvar and Sanan and all the other people out there. Uh, which is that essentially there is a, there's a push away from memory corruption bugs. It used to be the best minds in security went into finding overflows, exploiting overflows, and doing overflow stuff, right? You were always getting a shell and popping up things, shell code. How many papers in FRAC are about shell code, right? Each and every paper, the wor world's worst paper, but they're all there. Uh, and that was, that, was, that was certainly a style. Uh, and now that it's not in the news and it's not exploitable by people in their spare time at night, uh, it's, it's very, very interesting to see how your minds here in the audience are changing about it. What new technologies you're paying attention to, what technologies you're not paying attention to, what you think your risk is versus what your risk actually is, because uh, I guarantee you your risk is higher in this area than you, you think it is because of this little facet of psychology we're exploring here. And I, I use the giraffe, and this is the famous giraffe, but I use the giraffe just as an example here because there's a reason giraffes have that hugely long neck, and the reason is because it allows them to actually eat in the African savanna where nothing else can. Uh, and this is where the professionals are, right? The professionals have built the huge neck, and they're perfectly happy eating the rest of the forest. Uh, and that's the end of the little talk. And it was not as funny as expected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the laptop. <laughs> it's okay, you owe me one now. That was nice, wait a Ah, oh, whatever. Up.